Okay, great. Um, okay, hello. Um, my name is Liza Jacoby. Uh, I'm a junior at Williams College, uh, and I'm majoring in mathematics and in philosophy. Um, yeah, I'm going to share with everyone some tiling theory work I did with two of my peers, Cameron Edgar and Peter Hollander. Um, and we were advised by Dr. Colin Adams, uh, whose tiling theory course we took uh, spring 2020, like before the world ended. Um, uh, so yeah, here's, um, oh, wait, why aren't you working? Okay, here's an outline uh, of what I'm going to talk about. Um, the background I'll give is just like to familiarize you all with what tiling looks like. So we'll be drawing analogies between tiling the Euclidean plane and tiling the surface of the sphere. Um, and I'll also go over the work of Plato, Archimedes, and Johnson, uh, which preceded the work that we're doing here. Um, so with that, uh, we can, sorry, I don't know why it's doing that. It's like not letting me switch. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, so we define a tiling of the Euclidean plane to be a covering of E2 by geometric shapes, which don't have gaps between them and which don't overlap. Um, and the shapes that make up these tilings, we call them tiles, they're always going to be topologically equivalent to a disk. Um, and the same is true on the surface of the sphere, uh, but we only have a finite amount of surface area instead of infinity to cover. Um, and we also have spherical trig and geometry to consider. So when we're thinking about a polygonal tiling on the sphere, the tiles in question are like, they're spherical polygons. So that means they're just like, they're bounded by gray circles instead of lines like they would be in the plane. So here we see different kinds of triangles tiling the sphere. Um, but like the ones that we see here, uh, all of the tiles align perfectly on their edges, but like that doesn't need to be the case. So we wanted to find new vocabulary for the types of vertices we're gonna see in this case versus the alternative, which is when the tiles don't align perfectly along their edges. Um, so we define a full vertex to be when three or more tiles meet perfectly at their corners. So V here is a full vertex, like all the edges here are aligning perfectly and we have like three corners meeting here at V. Uh, alternatively, a half vertex is when uh, we have two or more tiles meeting at their corners along the edge of a third tile. So we have W as a half vertex here and T1 and T2 meet along the edge of T3. Um, and so these two have supplementary interior angles here where they meet along the edge of the other tile. Um, so now that we know about full and half vertices, we can define edge to edge and non edge to edge. So um, if the intersection of two tiles is entirely the edge, then uh, those two tiles meet edge to edge. So an edge to edge tiling is one um, when this is always happening. So all the vertices in an edge to edge tiling are going to be full vertices. Um, and then on the other hand, we have tiles meeting in a non edge to edge manner when their edges don't perfectly align with one another. Um, so if we have any half vertices in a tiling, we're going to have a non edge to edge tiling. So this is a tiling. Um, it's called, it's, it's among the Penrose tilings and this is an edge to edge tiling. And then here uh, we can see that we have half vertices occurring like along the edges of some of these pentagons. So that makes this a non edge to edge tiling. Um, okay, so uh, when we're tiling with polygons, we like to see like what kind of symmetries we can get. So consequently, we like to look at what regular polygons can do and like, in the plane, that's going to be an infinite process, right? Because we have infinity in E2. Um, so here's some edge to edge tiling patterns by regular polygons. We just like keep repeating these patterns ad infinitum in the plane. Um, and we, you can see like all the really amazing symmetries we're going to get here. And even in the non edge to edge case, we're still going to get really great symmetries with like reflections, rotations, and glide reflections and stuff like that. Um, and from now on, we're only going to be looking at tilings that have regular polygons. So when I say a tiling from now on, that's just going to mean that the tiling in question is one by regular polygons. Um, so what happens when we move to the sphere? Uh, it gets a little tricky, uh, but basically uh, when we are tiling the sphere edge to edge, um, we do get a full classification and they come from polyhedra, which have a circumscribing sphere. So um, we end up getting a complete classification of the edge to edge tilings from the prisms and antiprisms, the platonic solids, the Archimedean solids, and 25 out of the 92 Johnson solids. Um, so if we're given one of these circumscribable polyhedra, uh, we can project the edges and vertices onto the circumscribing sphere, um, and that will yield the tilings. So um, here, 
Um, all, these are the platonic tilings. So we have the tetrahedron, the hexahedron, the octahedron, icosahedron, and dodecahedron, uh, where we projected the edges and vertices out onto S2. Um, and then this is the Archimedean tilings. Uh, so when we do the same thing with the Archimedean solids, we project onto the sphere, and then we get these really nice tilings here. Um, and then the Johnson solids, the 25 of those, and then the prisms and antiprisms, like thus complete the list. Um, so what happens when we move to non-edge to edge though? Um, until now, there hasn't been a full classification of the possibilities. So where I wanna start with is the motivation behind our research um, and talk about something we call vertex restriction. Um, so it started with a question during office hours for tiling theory. Um, so what does a non-edge to edge tiling of the sphere even look like? Um, so answering this question begins with looking at what happens at vertices and specifically half vertices on S2. Uh, so we consider the angle measures of regular polygons on the sphere when we're excluding bygones. Um, so the geodesics on the sphere, uh, they're going to be great circles. So we rely on different geometry than we do in the Euclidean plane and side length and angle measure are increasing proportionally for regular spherical polygons. So that gives us this lemma which is giving us the bounds for n gons n greater than or equal to three. So like these are the lower and upper bounds of what the angle measures can be on the sphere. Um, so then we can look at what the vertex restriction is. Um, so what do I mean by vertex restriction? I mean that we're limited in what types of polygons we can place at half vertices. So this is a proposition that like really jump-started our work. And it says that we can't have an M gone for M greater than or equal to six out of half vertex. Um, and to prove this based on what we know from the previous lemma, we just need to show that it doesn't work for M equal six. And then the argument goes through for any larger M as well. So from this lemma, we get that the lower bound on a regular spherical hexagon's angle measures is two pi over three. So even for a really small hexagon, one that's almost Euclidean, like it's so small, it's practically flat. Uh, we still have less than pi over three left over at the half vertex uh, when the lower bound on a regular spherical triangle uh, for the interior angles, it's pi over three. So we can't fill the space here that's left over with any regular spherical n gone and greater than or equal to three. We could fill it with a bygone, but we're excluding bygones in this research. So we can't have hexagons at half vertices and then the argument uh, holds for uh, bigger M because the angles only get bigger for larger polygons. Um, and so this gives us the following corollary that the only combinations we can get out of half vertex are triangle, triangle, triangle square, and triangle pentagon. Um, and we use the same lemma about the angle bounds. We see that the two squares, like if we put two squares together, they're gonna yield a combined angle of greater than pi. And then a square in pentagon would be, I guess, seven pi over six and two pentagons greater than four pi over three. Um, so like if we, here are just some examples of like, if we started with a single tile and we wanted to tile around it in a non-edge to edge way with the triangles, like, of course we could also put squares or pentagons here. Um, but this is what that would start to look like if we just placed one tiled around it. Um, so we can only have like triangle, 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 square, and triangle pentagon. Um, okay, yeah. Uh, so we now have an idea of like what the intuitions were when we went into this research. So we can start looking at the actual results, but I also know that that was a lot. So if anyone has any questions, I can like answer a quick one now. I also can't see the chat thing. So maybe just say it if you have one. No worries about the question. It's going to be in the end, okay? Okay. <laughs> um, okay, so um, we end up with uh, 31 distinct possibilities for non-edged edge tilings, um, each of which is either like an infinite family or just one rigid tiling. And I'm gonna go through all of these, show you what they look like, and then we can like talk about their construction and then also talk a little bit about the combinatorial way we went about proving the list to be exhaustive. Um, so this is the large result. Um, we limit ourselves to regular n-gons for n greater than or equal to three. And we get the classification of the 31 tilings into six categories, kaleidoscope, two hemisphere, lunar, sporadic, composed, and magic triangle tilings. Um, okay, yeah, so uh, we're gonna first go over the kaleidoscope tilings. Here are uh, three representatives. 
Um, these were the first that we found and they're super cool because they can actually be parameterized uh, by the interior angles of the polygons. And that's unique to this uh, category of tilings. The other ones we can't parameterize in the same kind of way. Um, so, and also like notice that each of these represents our vertex, half vertex combination. So here we have triangle, triangle, triangle square and triangle pentagon. Um, so the reason I say that these families are parameterized is because we can like, we can choose the smaller of the two tiles that are, that make up the tiling and we can continually increase the interior angles until we have an edge to edge tiling and then continue so that the other tile, the, the, like the one that's originally smaller ends up being the bigger one. Um, and like here I can, I have figures for that. So if we start with the, um, the triangle triangle family, we get a continuum that like starts with the tetrahedron. If you take the small triangle and shrink its interior angles all the way down to zero, we get a tetrahedron. And then in the middle, it looks like this. And then when uh, the tiles meet edge to edge, it would be the octahedral tiling. Um, and then if you were to continue going the other way, you'd get an, an antiomorphic pair to this tiling, which is basically like if you held up a mirror to this tiling, it would look like a reflection of it in the mirror. Um, and then you would end up back at the tetrahedron again. Um, and like, so the other tilings, like we have these two families also, and the other two are going to look different from the other side of the continuum, but we can still do the same process. So this, uh, is going to be the octahedral to hexahedral continuum. We, uh, start with an octahedron here, and then we get like big triangles, little squares, and then we get to the cube octahedron. And then when we have the cube octahedron, we can go to like little triangles, big squares. And then once we shrink the triangles all the way down to zero, we end up with a hexahedron, um, which is interesting because it, it shows like why these Archimedean tilings are actually like called what they are, because like the cube, the octahedron, you get a cube octahedron. Um, and then the same applies for the icosahedral dodecahedral continuum. So we have the icosahedron um, and then we get little pentagons, big triangles, and then the icosadodecahedron, um, and then it switches which one is bigger, and then all the way down to the dodecahedron. Um, okay, so um, yeah, we can go to the next category of tilings, which are the two hemisphere tilings. Um, so those are exactly what they sound like. We just take two hemispheres and we stick them together so that the tiles along their boundaries don't align edge to edge. Um, so to go through these examples, we have uh, a hemisphere from the icosadodecahedron and one from the cube octahedron, and then in the middle, one from the octahedron and one from the cube octahedron. And then here we have the icosadodecahedron and the octahedron put together. Um, but like, okay, you could really do this with any tiling of S2. So you could even take an edge to edge tiling and rotate along the equator as long as the amount that you rotate by is different than what the um, edge length of the tiles is. So you get like infinitely many tilings in this family, even though we can't parameterize by the actual tile sizes. Um, so yeah, uh, speaking of edge to edge patches though, we can go to the lunar tilings. Um, so these are kind of constructed like a beach ball, I guess. I guess this one is the best example of that. Um, it's a similar construction to that of the kaleidoscope tilings. Um, we like start with two uh, of the same polygon on each pole. So we call them polar polygons, like here, pentagon, square, and then these two are both triangles. Um, and then we surround the polar polygons with bygones that are supplementary. Um, and now I know I said previously that we're excluding bygones, and we are. And the catch is that these bygones are actually um, loons that are taken from Archimedean tilings. Um, and what's a loon? It's just the intersection of two great circles. And so these are actually edge to edge patches that we've taken out of the Archimedean tilings and used to surround the polar polygons. Um, so these are from the cube octahedral tilings and the icosadodecahedral tilings. Um, and so that's how we get the lunar tilings out of there. We have like the two polar polygons and then, uh, or I guess two polar n-gons and then n copies of the same loon. And then there's only enough room on the other side for the same polygon. Um, and then also using loons, we get the sporadic tilings. So um, 
we uh, we are again taking these loons from edge to edge tilings of the sphere, and in this case, we're going to align four of them together, like all around um, the surface. And we can't just do this arbitrarily. Like we we have these options to take from. Basically, it's an area argument because S two has a total of eight pi as the area. So the combinations of loons from platonic and Archimedean tilings, uh, we can do one, two, one, three. We can do one, four, one, five, and two, four, three, five. Um, and those give us all of the uh, sporadic tilings. Um, so yeah, and uh, now that we've like become familiar with using edge to edge patches in our tilings, I can talk about the magic triangle, which I need to explain before I can explain the tilings involving the magic triangle. Um, so, uh, we just, we, let's look at this patch. It's from the icosododecahedral tiling. Um, it's made up of three pentagons and four triangles. And this is going to be what we call our magic triangle um, because it makes an equilateral triangular patch. So um, when we like blank it out, we could use that as one singular tile. Um, so in the same way that we were able to use bygones and like align them edge to edge with one another, but like tile the insides differently so that we yielded non edge to edge tilings, we can do the same with this triangular patch here. Um, so we're gonna be able to either compose or decompose it where like decomposed is what it looks like here where it's broken up into smaller polygons, but if it's composed, it's just gonna be used as one singular tile. Um, so uh, this is the, kind of thing we're going to be focusing on for the last two categories of tilings. Um, so these are the composed tilings where we take the icosododecahedral tiling and we can compose like three of the magic triangles, just two of them, or in this case, just one of them. And so then we're using these big triangles to like create half vertices and create non edge to edgeness in our icosododecahedral tiling. Um, and then we also get the magic triangle tiling, which is like weird enough that it gets its own category. Um, and it's basically just like, you could think of it like a complementary tiling to this one because it's like you decompose opposite components. We just blank out the whole thing except for the magic triangle patch. Um, okay, uh, yeah. So now I'm gonna do like a very not rigorous <laughs> proof. Um, mostly just for the sake of time, but we split into two cases and we really just care about when the smallest, we wanna start with the smallest side length tile and build out from there. Um, and so uh, these are the cases, it's when it's a singleton uh, and then the other cases when it's in an edge to edge patch. So first we're gonna let um, the smallest side length tile be a singleton. So when we try to surround it with um, tiles with like a larger edge length, um, it's going to look something like this. And we, uh, from this case, we're going to get the kaleidoscope tilings in one of the lunar tilings. We can get a kaleidoscope tiling by putting another copy of T in all of these gaps here. And that's going to force the rest of the tiling to fill out like a kaleidoscope tiling. Um, it just depends on what polygon you start with in the middle. Um, the reason I used pentagons though, is because if instead we put squares on the outside, then we're going to end up getting the um, cube octahedral loon. And that's how we're getting one of these lunar tilings here from this construction. Um, so that's th these are what we get. Um, and then for the second case, we're going to suppose that the smallest tile is in an edge to edge patch. Um, and then the subcase of the subcases of that are like magic triangles decomposed and magic triangles composed. So first, we're going to suppose that all of the patches that are like this are all gonna be decomposed into smaller polygons. And that means that any edge to edge patch of uh, tiles like on the tiling is gonna be a bygone or a hemisphere. Um, and that is gonna lead to, um, I'm pretty sure that leads to all of the rest of the tilings. Yeah, at least all of the rest of the tilings except for the ones involving the magic triangle. Um, so we're going to get the remaining three lunar tilings, the sporadic tilings, two hemisphere tilings without um, the icosadodectrahedral hemisphere with a composed triangle. Um, and then in the last case, we are going to um, compose magic triangles, and then that gives us the rest of the tilings, uh, all the ones that are composed or involving a magic triangle. Um, okay, so 
uh, just future directions um, currently in progress by my friend here at Williams right now um, is the classification including bygones. Um, and then this summer I'm working with Professor Adams on tiling branched coverings of the sphere using regular polygons again. Um, okay, uh, here are my references. Um, sorry, I know I'm going a little bit over, um, but I wanted to thank the Math for All organizers um, and also, of course, thank Professor Adams and Cameron and Peter for all the help they've uh like just for all the really great work we've done um yeah and like if anyone has questions after the fact i put my website here where my contact info is um yeah sorry i was talking really fast at the end there i just wanted to get through the proof but yeah okay. thank you